knowing I can be more and I could be less. Yeah. But accepting exactly who I am in this moment and not just accepting, but embracing mm-hmm. and acknowledging and valuing right. who I am in this exact moment. Hello and welcome to Self Talk. I'm your host, Rachel Astarte. Today, my guest is Shana Francesca. She is a speaker, writer, and entrepreneur. She's the founder and lead designer at Consonate, which is a multidiscipline interior design and life design firm working with clients around the country. She was born into a difficult family life and refused to allow that to define her. Shana believes that our present and future are transformed when we infuse infuse our lives with intention, and therefore we design when we design our lives. We become the authors of our story, which I think is such a beautiful sentiment, and I want to welcome you to self-talk today, Shana. Thanks for having me, Rachel. I'm really, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, and I'm really excited to, to jump into our topic today, which is living a non-traditional romantic life. Yeah. And I don't think that this subject is talked about nearly enough. So, I want to dive into I want to dive into it, but first I want to talk yeah. into uh, about how you got into your field. Um yeah. what was the calling to get into this this work you do? Um long story as short as I can make it. Um, I grew up in a severely abusive household in a religious, an alt-right religious uh, evangelical Christian cult. Um, So it was a lot. (laughs) And I'm also neurodivergent. I uh, diagnosed with ADHD at five and recently came to recognize I have autism spectrum disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the world was not was not for me Mm -hmm. (laughs) felt like it was completely against me from the beginning and so as a means of survival I began to develop a very elaborate um imaginary life I I Mm -hmm. created an entire world inside of my head I used like JC Penny catalogs back in the day and I would like go through and I would circle all the things that I wanted to be a part of the life I was choosing for myself. And I would dog ear the pages so I could go and flip back through. It was like my own version of vision boarding before I even knew, before I even had the language for that, before there even really was language for that. Um, And I used the walls of my bedroom. I would write down quotes. Remember when we used to actually use physical calendars and they always had inspirational quotes. And then I would read books and I would write down quotes from people just to just to empower myself to recognize there was a way out. There was a way through, even though there was no one in my life whose life I wanted to emulate, right? Because typically when you grow up in an abusive environment in a cult, everyone around you is mirroring the same behavior, right? You're not, you're not living a really crappy life. And then uh, uh, the people around you are amazing. That unfortunately is not true. Um, And so I think for me, what I began to recognize, and now I have the language for it, I obviously didn't then, is that my bedroom became my sanctuary. It became a vision board for my life. It became Mm. the stage from which I wanted to tell the story of my life. And so like when really difficult things would happen, I would reset that stage, right? I would Mm. move my furniture around. I would create a new connection with the space around me. Um, And that translated to, as I got older, recognizing the power of space um, there was a study that came out in 2019 that recognized that the three most important things to our happiness, uh, number one is our mental health. Number two is our home. Mm. We spend two thirds of our life inside of our home, right? We make a predominant number of the decisions that we make every day inside of our home. And for so many people, it is not a true and authentic reflection of who they, um, of who they are, right? Mm-hmm. Our home becomes a reflection of who we see ourselves as. Mm-hmm. Um, but but for many people, it can also be corrupted by who they think other people want to see them as. Right. Right. And right. so it can become this stage production for other people rather than recognizing when and when I say it's the stage from which to tell we tell the story of our life, it's not in a it's not in a performative way. It's in a way that we recognize that a stage is a setting for a moment, right? It sets an intention, it sets a mood, it sets a, a culture, right? For a moment. 
Um, and when we recognize the power of that, we can really sit with that and we can have it be a beautiful reflection of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so when I came to recognize that, and obviously at like 15, I didn't have that language, but I felt it in my soul. Um, I started to recognize that in being an interior designer was a thing. And then um, went to school to be an interior designer and uh, and started out my career as an interior designer. Um, and then started to recognize when I started my own business about five years ago that there was a much more powerful conversation that I was having with clients around designing their lives, right? Yeah. Just sitting down and being like, what do we want it to look like? I was sitting down and saying, what's the story you want your life to tell? Yes. Then I can recognize how I can set that stage set your home as that stage mm-hmm. and we can have it support you in the story of your life rather than you supporting it. Right. right? Yeah. Right? And so that became this very powerful shift um, that, that really became clear to me. And I really started forming the language around. Um, so, you know, finitely about four years ago. That's excellent. And, and yeah. when I was first reading your bio and reading about you and visiting your website, I thought what a wonderful combination yeah. Of interior design, literally and figuratively. Yeah. Yeah. You know it's I mean? Design and then it's interior design. Yeah. 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 That's fantastic. I <laughs> yeah, love it. Yeah. Um, and so um that so so what we're really talking about is reflecting our true selves outwardly in the space yeah. that we live in. Yeah, knowing that we can take up space beautifully right. and intentionally, right? It's not about taking space from other people, it's not about colonizing. Right. It's about recognizing that we can sp- take up space beautifully and intentionally, and it can be and should be a, a reflection of ourselves. And I say that with with there's a lot of nuance to that in that not everybody lives by themselves, right? So every person that lives within a home or within mm-hmm. a space should also be reflected in that space. And there's a there's a collage that happens, beautiful medley that happens when yeah. these things blend, and everyone gets to be seen and heard and understood inside of a space. Yeah, that's fantastic. It almost seems as though that's how interior design should be done. Correct. <laughs> now that I, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, it's like other yeah. other than that, it's what it's, you yeah. Yeah. what you were saying is we're trying to be something we think we should. Oh, this is the right. popular style yeah. for it, living yeah. rooms yeah. or whatever. It shouldn't be a reflection of marketing. It should yes. be a reflection of our of our of our authentic selves. Yeah, right, because it is. Uh, who we are in, yeah. in and where we spend so much of our time, especially yeah. during a pandemic. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. When it's cold out and when there's a pandemic. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah. that leads me to the question about when we, since we're concentrating on the self and, and we're going to move into the the topic of this particular episode, but what does the self mean to you? How would you define it for yourself or in general? I think, I think, I think that's the thing we're trying to get to in our life is to define what that means. <laughs> I think that's the entire journey of our life, trying to figure out that definition. Um, I, I think it's just being present for me. It's just being present to whoever I am in this exact moment, mm. not wishing to be anyone else or, you know, wishing I was more or less knowing I can be more and I could be less yeah but accepting exactly who I am in this moment and not just accepting but embracing Mm -hmm. and acknowledging and valuing who I am in this exact moment right beautifully I think that's really beautifully said and and not being so concerned about what others might think of that hi it's Rachel here If you'd like to dive deeper into your own self-development, but you're looking for an alternative to traditional talk therapy, I think you'll love the Foundation of Self Immersion program. For a full year, you'll get dynamic coursework you can complete on your own time, plus weekly coaching calls and monthly one-on-one sessions with me for personal support. Visit foundationofself.com and click on the events page for more information. That's foundationofself.com. Now, back to the episode. Yeah, right. but that's really hard. I mean, it it's is. Really, yeah, there's so much pressure to fulfill other people's expectations because mm-hmm. other people are challenged by us mm-hmm. living our lives in ways they wish they could or yeah. they would allow themselves, right? Because they can. Right. They just, they're just not allowing themselves to or 
and or they couldn't survive in society if they did. Right. right. Or they think they couldn't. <laughs> right. There's so, much, there's so much nuance to the conversation, right? Because of systems of oppression and so on and so forth. But there are still are choices we can make. There are still choices we have power over and focusing on the ones we do have power over and nudging and changing and, um, you know, the ones that need to change uh, is just part of the journey. Yeah. Beautifully said. Um, so let's shift into the topic of living a non-traditional romantic lifestyle. I mean, yeah. there's non-traditional lifestyle in, in it is a whole other episode, but, yeah. but tell us a little bit about uh, what that means to you. What is a non-traditional romantic? Yeah, life? for me, and I, and I think it's as iterative as I am, right? So in my twenties, it meant, um, in my twenties, it meant being ethically non-monogamous, although that wasn't a term yet. Yeah, right. um, you know, it meant being honest about the fact that I wasn't seeing just one person at a time. There was a lot of shame for me back then because I was still, you know, I didn't walk away from the church cult that I grew up in until I was 26. I was wow. 25, 26. So like right when my brain fully formed, my brain was like, wait a second, <laughs> this is, is not okay. And we're going to walk away. Uh -huh. Um, and so right around that time is when I just started experimenting with what exactly did I want? Because I'd been told my whole life to want monogamy, to be chosen by a man, to have kids, to settle down, to care for that person and those people at my own detriment, to be selfless, so on and so forth. And none of it ever really rang true for me. Mm. Um, now, now I realize that. But at the time, I was still trying to figure out, does it? You know, what does that mean? what does monogamy mean? What, what is my own pleasure? Where does it come from? You know, can I explore it without going to hell? <laughs> right? Like right. these were all questions that I was asking myself. I, of course, I don't believe in hell anymore, but, but at the time I still very much was trying to figure out what in the world, I mean, 26 years of indoctrination, you don't just wake up one day exactly. out of it. I, I can honestly say that it took um, another 20 years Mm -hmm. No, it took into, or sorry, another 10 years. It took until I was 35, um, till I walked completely away from church in general and religion mm -hmm. and yeah. started really deeply just allowing myself to sit in that. So, you know, delving through all of that, I just started dating in a way that was like, at the time I saw as rebellious, but now I just see that I didn't recognize that authority, right? Rebellion only exists, uh, if we recognize authority. Right. Recognize that authority. It's not rebellion. You're simply just living your life. Right. right. Um, and so I just started living my life. I, <clears throat> I started competing and performing in the salsa dancing world. And that gave me really ac a lot of access to a lot of a variety of lovers um, from all over the country. And mm -hmm. so <clears throat> I really just took on lovers. <laughs> That's what I did. Like I, and in reality, I'd started taking on lovers when I, I, when I was 15. So mm -hmm. I, my first consensual sexual experiences when I was 15, I had had lovers before then, but it was usually just one at a time. I was hiding it. I was still living with my parents, all of these things. So when I hit my 20s, I was living on my own and suddenly I could do whatever I wanted. And I didn't have to worry about what other people thought about who I brought home or when I brought them home. There was no rules. Right. Um, except the ones that I said. And so it was just being ethically non-monogamous. And then uh, I entered into a polyamorous relationship um, when I was about 27. And I was in that relationship for a year and a half. Um, and I have to tell you, it taught me an, an incredible amount. To be in a polyamorous relationship, there has to be a dedication on every single person's part. Mm -hmm. to have open, honest um, dialogue about expectations, about intentions, about wants, thoughts, desires, about needs. And every single person has to be having that conversation with every other person who's a part of that relationship. Right? right. And really that kind of conversation should be happening no matter what relationship, but it isn't typical of heteronormative society, right? right? Because of gender roles, because of expectation, it's like, no, you're just going to behave like this and so on. And that's it. So there's no conversation about it because no conversation needs to be had because you're falling. Right. So the minute polyamory entered my life, it was like this whole nother definition mm. of what it means to communicate inside of a relationship and to talk about what you want, to mm -hmm. say what you want out loud. Yeah. Right. Not just to do what you want, but to say what you want, because there's so much power 
in in language, right? Mm-hmm. There's a reason yeah. why in so many religions, things are, you know, especially in Christianity, right? The, the world was spoken into existence, right? Because it's a recognition of the, the word, power. yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. It's a recognition of the power of language. Um and so it really started to shape and mold um what I thought about the world. And quite frankly, at this point, so those the two people that I was in the polyamorous relationship with, they're still my very good friends. We're still friends all these years later. We're just not romantically involved anymore. They're two of my best friends. Wow. Because of the way that we communicated with one another, right? Mm-hmm. So when the relationship was no longer serving my needs, I simply went to them and said, this is not serving my what I want anymore and I want something different. And then there was space and time given to heal. And then we just returned to a friendship without that romantic aspect. That's and then we would talk about when those romantic feelings would come back up and visit and we would have to like take a breath and take a pause and honor and respect each other because we'd already established yeah. the connection, right? And so it taught me such beautiful things about how to communicate that I just kind of have carried that with me. There are times in my life that I've been in a monogamous relationship, but even then, I don't know that it was like typical (laughs) (laughs) wasn't like necessarily adhering to heteronormativity in the way that we're taught right Right. and all those things um but even still to this day uh and there's times where i've taken a break from dating entirely um you know for a year two years at a time just to like be with myself and Mm. and establish that kind of like romantic connection with serving my own needs yeah and then been like okay it's time to head back out there. And, um, you know, at this point I'm, I'm back to a place of, uh, of ethical non-monogamy. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. So, and, and there, there's a lot, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining you walking this path. Yeah. Um, there, there were so many, um, possible obstacles and challenges, not the least of which was growing up in a religious cult and yeah. allowing yourself to say, yeah. no, this choice that I'm making yeah. resonates with me and that has to be okay. Yeah. That in and of itself is a huge leap. Huge. How it how is. did you do that? I'm not going to lie. There's still times that it comes up, right? Yeah. And it will probably for a good portion of the rest of my life. I'd love to believe that it will disappear entirely at some point. <laughs> the closer I get to 40, the, the quieter that voice gets, right? Sure. Um, but, uh, but I think a little bit at a time, like it started out as me just being like, can I say bad words? Of course. <laughs> uh, like, like, just like fuck the rules. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, and at first it felt like rebellion, like I said, and then it had to come to a place where I was like, who gets to decide who makes the rules? Right. And then I was like, me. And then I'm like, do I have the right to say that I'm the one who makes the rules? Like all of these questions, there was so much questioning. Sure. Right? And this is, I think, why curiosity has showed up as such an important part of my life and my work is that curiosity could cure the world. It's the knowing that traps us, mm-hmm. right? It's the the knowing, the thinking we know it. That's like right. we're yeah. right. We well, know. yeah, it closes all the doors it and puts you in. Right. Right. Yeah. And so I think what I, what I had to do was embrace my curiosity. I had to leave behind the concept that curiosity killed the cat. Right. Cause I think that's it's such, it seems so innocuous. But that's you know. anything but innocuous. It's, mm. it's violent. Mm. Curiosity is in direct opposition of the world we live in. Right. Which is why they try to squash it in us. So, so early it's the industry. They must industrialize us as human beings, yes. right? Our yeah. schooling system, so on and so forth is in, in an effort to, you know, to industrialize humans. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think I just had to get to the place where I was like, I just had to step out of line, right? Step off the production line, let myself do that question everything. And to this day, I still, I question everything. I'm like, Oh, that's an interesting assumption. Like, is it right though? Like, you know, most of the time I just tell people I'm, I'm agnostic at times. I feel like I'm an atheist, but then I'm like, and then I bounce back to being agnostic. Cause I really don't know. I don't know anything. I don't know anything. Right. And so I think it was just getting to the place where I let myself be like, if I don't, if I don't know what I know, if I'm not sure that I know, then how the hell is anybody else so sure? Right. Right. Are they? 
Yeah. Are they so sure? And then I would have these conversations with people and I would realize nobody has any idea what the hell they're doing. Mm -hmm. No one, no one. And so once I came to that realization, I recognized that then no one had any authority over me. Mm. None. Because they didn't know what they were doing any more than I did. Yeah. Right. And as a matter of fact, they probably knew less because they pretended they knew. Yeah. 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 And so I think that has been an important part of my healing process and my process of just stepping away and, and just being like, let's just, I don't know, we're all flying by the seat of our pants. Let's just do it. <laughs> you know? Let's right. just embrace it. Right. Does, does it ever get, um, this is probably the wrong word. I was going to use the word lonely. Does it ever get, and I, and I'm not talking about your romantic relationship, but I'm talking about that cosmic shift in the yeah. way that you see the world and, and being more of an outlier in your views. Yeah. Um, does that get lonely or is that yeah. empowering? Yeah. Tell me. Both. What, yeah. It's, okay. I mean, oh, we, we live in so much nuance. I think as human beings, we're never one thing. Dichotomies are absolutely false. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I am both empowered and sometimes lonely, mm-hmm. you know, because I don't get to have this conversation with too many people who truly deeply feel it yes. in their soul, right? They may understand it intellectually. They understand the words I'm saying, but they don't, it doesn't necessarily, it resonates with part of them, but they don't, they don't know it yet. Right? right. They don't truly know it within their body, within their soul. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, there are times that it gets slow, especially that's why I took a step away. I only just recently started dating again. I took a step away for two years mm-hmm. because there was such a cosmic shift that was happening within my understanding of the world when I left religion. Mm-hmm. I think I need to just put the brakes on here. I think I need to just sort through. And I see PTSD, um, obviously, <laughs> tremendously terrible traumatic environment um and so you know I was reading the body keeps the score and I something Mm. very difficult had happened um and the combination of the two just kind of sent me into this space where I was like I think I I need to take a step away and so yeah it was very it was kind of lonely but it was a choice I made and so it was empowering right so it's both yeah It's, it's not either it's and right um But I am finding, especially, and it's funny because I've actually found things, most social media is, is not my, been my friend, but there is a huge neurodivergent community on Mm -hmm. TikTok Mm -hmm. and having really incredible conversations together about the way that we see the world, the way that we understand the world. And a lot of uh, people, um, but also people raised as male, um, recognizing the detriment of patriarchy mm-hmm. and oppression and, and being able to have those conversations. And so as, and, and I've made a lot of friendships with people from TikTok, it, you know, we've transferred that into real life okay. um, as much as we can, right. Like via zoom or whatever, because we're all over the world. Um, but that has allowed me to connect with all kinds of people. So it's become less lonely. Right. Mm-hmm. Because yes. there's there's a sense of community. There's a there is a, 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 you know, a form of community, even though it doesn't happen necessarily in real life. There's there's community there. Well, now you've just stepped into my next question. So well done. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, because so I as as part of my work, I work a lot with uh, obviously self-development, but solitude being an extremely important part of our self-development yeah, and being able to be comfortable in solitude, being able to do our truly deep work in solitude yeah. for the purpose of bringing that self out into the world and yeah. finding community and contributing to community. So I was going to yeah. ask you, um, what are your thoughts about solitude and community and how they work separately yeah. and together? Yeah. I think solitude has to exist so profoundly in our society because there is no real sense of true community, Mm -hmm. right? Like, I think we have to, we have to, when we're healing, when we're doing things, we are hot, we have to step away from society because it's so toxic. Mm -hmm. Can't, it's really hard to heal inside of toxic. It's not community, like inside of toxic it's not society, connection, it, society. Yeah. I don't even know what we call it. It's just toxic, right? Yeah. So we have to step away 
and take this moment of solitude and gather our thoughts because there aren't other people necessarily, you know, around us who are in as, there aren't that many people around us necessarily who are all that healthy inside of their head. Right. Right. And we're all kind of deconstructing all of this at the same time and not at the same speed and not in the same way. And right. so, you know, I think, I think the, being able to be alone is, and to be in solitude is really important, but I think it helps us to gain perspective because I think it helps us to gain perspective of what we would like community for ourselves to look like. Exactly. Yeah. And then to be able to be open to and to look for, um, because I think it's a balance of the two, right? Right. We can't run in a direction. We don't know where we're going. We don't know how necessarily how to create community because we never really have. Right. right. But we can take one step forward. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think that solitude helps us to, to create an anchor, to create a foundation. Mm-hmm. that then we can build community on top of. Beautifully said. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's the whole point. Like a lot of the self work that we do is essential because if you're not doing that work and you try to build a community, you're bringing a, a a broken person to a community, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. If you have these amazing people who are going to help you through your stuff, yeah, yeah, but it's right. not yeah. their responsibility to do that. Much of that initial work has to be done to be yeah. on your own. Yeah, yeah I, and- I, had, I, I formed this language around it um, a couple of years ago is that I think there's there's a time and a place and a really beautiful importance to rock bottom. Mm-hmm. Yes. When we think about that language, rock bottom is a foundation, mm-hmm. right? Rock bottom happens when we tear down everything that was built for us or told us we needed to build. Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately we've recognized isn't for us. Right? right. And, and it might be that we hit rock bottom in a way that's very unpleasant, usually because of us trying to numb the fact that we've got to tear apart everything we were told we needed to be right. right. That's an exceptionally painful process. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we when we hit rock bottom, what we've hit is a foundation that then we can repair and we can we can mold and then we can build something beautiful and intentional top of. Right. I love that. And and what's also beautiful about rock bottom when it's really the rock bottom is yeah. the very next step you take can only go up. Oh, so exactly. you can't get any yep. lower than rock bottom. No, no you so can't. You no, know you're in a good place. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I love it. Exactly. So if there was one thing you wish that everybody could know um, that you wish maybe you could just implant in people's minds um, and everyone would would get it, what would that thing be? To embrace curiosity. I, I There's so much wrapped up in curiosity, right? In vulner, it's vulnerability, right? Because to be curious, you have to admit you don't know. Not yeah. only do you have to admit you don't know, you have to accept that you don't know. Right. And you have to be willing to embrace the learning and the, you know, the playfulness. I mean, there's playfulness, there's vulnerability, there's exploration. There's so much involved in curiosity that it sparks joy mm-hmm. in our life, right? Mm-hmm. And so for me, you know, curiosity is that foundation. I, I wish everyone, um, I wish I could just make that connection for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. I love that. That's a great way. Um, a great reminder, I think for people to stay curious. Um, yeah. Beautiful. So how can listeners find you, Shana? Yeah. The easiest way is, I know, I know you'll tag in the show notes is through my website or my link tree. Um, both have, uh, all of my links to social media has my email, has my telephone number, um, so that you can reach out. My website is uh, www.consonate.world. Um, you can find all kinds of information about me as a speaker, as a writer, you know, as a, a somebody who I, you know, leads group coaching, whatever it is, it's all there um, for people to access. So yeah, if you want to reach out and connect with me, that's the best way. Beautiful. Well, Shana, I want to thank you so much for being on Self Talk. This was an excellent and very necessary discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hi, this is Rachel Astarte from the Self Talk Podcast. I'd love for you to send me your emails with questions or stories about yourself. What are you looking for? What are your questions? What, what are you grappling with in your own personal life? 
that has to do with your identity, with yourself, with your very existence. These are the things that we're going to talk about during the podcast. And go ahead. It's all right. Get deep. I can handle it. So send them to Rachel at selftalkpodcast.com. And I'll see you on the next episode.